I'm going to pass on now to David Liddington, our next speaker, who uh, may need very little introduction. He is the MP for Ellsbury uh, from 1992 to 2019. Um, during his office, he had uh, extremely senior government positions, including Chancellor of the Duchy of, Duchy of Lancaster, Secretary of State for Justice, and Leader of the House of Commons. Um, he was recently appointed Chair of the Conservative European Forum, um, and uh, we're really delighted to have him here to talk about uh, a Conservative uh, perspective on where we are now. David, welcome. Right, I hope, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope the audio is working reasonably well and that my my lockdown haircut isn't too distracting or lack of haircut isn't too distracting for, for everybody. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity um, to speak for a few minutes and then I hope to spend a few minutes um, answering any questions that, that people may have before we move on to the next session. I think it's really important that the European movement remains a cross-party, all-party organisation because I think one of the keys to re-establishing the kind of relationship with other European countries and with the European Union as uh, uh, an institution uh, is, is that we uh, do so demonstrating uh, that this approach to the future of the United Kingdom, the outlook of the United Kingdom, is something that commands support from right across the political spectrum, certainly from centre-left to centre-right in, in British politics. Um, and even at the 2019 general election, when views were very, very polarised, probably about a fifth of Conservative voters then, if you look at the polls, um, were people who had most definitely voted Remain in the referendum in 2016. Um, what I want to say is going to be a combination of some, I suspect, rather unwelcome uh, uh, points, which, but which I believe to be truths that we, uh, as people who supported Remain and still want to see a close partnership between the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe, need to recognise, but also some points about hope and action for the future. Let me start with the unwelcome truths. I mean, the first, it's most obvious, is that we did lose. And however many times you replay the tape of 2016, we still lose. And if there's anything I've learned in uh, about 46 years now of, of being actively involved in British politics, it is that you uh, win very few arguments by going around shouting at the electorate about how they got it all dreadfully wrong and they need to admit their fault uh, and change their minds. That's not what's going to work for us in the future. And partly for that reason, I also believe that talk now about a campaign to rejoin the European Union is futile. I think that that is not where the British public are. You probably look at the polls, you'll find that uh, the majority now saying that uh, they, they, they regret the decision, or that has come back a bit since uh, uh, the success of the vaccine program, uh, but no really strong appetite for actually rejoining uh, the European Union. So rejoining now, even if it were to happen, would not settle the question, nor would a campaign to rejoin have the sort of um, cross-party, the sort of uh, broad support that I think is needed in order to make a, whatever the new relationship is like when it is properly established, sustainable into the long term. And partly because there would not be a UK consensus on rejoining, frankly, I don't think the EU27 are going to be that interested in spending a lot of time and energy on that when they have spent uh, now uh, nearly five years going through all the agonies of, of uh, the, the exit negotiations and the divorce settlement. And I think one of the, the dangers for leavers and remainers alike has been to overestimate the extent to which for our friends in the 27, 
uh, the UK is a first order priority for them. I found it very striking when I read the German presidency document for the second half of last year, that there was one single mention of the United Kingdom and Brexit uh, uh, in, in a paragraph between a parag one paragraph between the one on the United States and the one on China. And in a Portuguese presidency document, which is about 35 pages or something in length, um, there were three mentions, all an almost identical, very, very bland sentence about wanting good relations consistent with the interests of member states and the treaties. Um, so I don't think that rejoining is where we should be. I think rather the task, and it's an urgent one and a vitally important one, is to rebuild relationships of trust, um, friendships that have become very badly bruised over the last five years, leading to a new and deep strategic partnership between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Geography and history haven't changed. On so many things, our interests continue to be aligned, not in everything. And, and the reality is now that we're no longer a member state, no longer helping shape EU decisions, that there will be points uh, where the, the collective interest of the 27 and the national interest of the UK differ. I can see that potentially, for example, on certain uh, issues to do with new technology. But if we look at cross-border trade and at supply chains, if we look at the common interest in resisting Russian attempts to destabilize Eastern Europe, the Western Balkans and Central European countries, if we look at the common need to resist and disrupt serious and organized crime and how that in turn leads to a convergence of interest on the importance of political stability in the Western Balkans and on building state capacity within Africa against serious and organized crime and against terrorist and extremist networks. You can see how that convergence ought to shape a constructive habit of working together, which forms the basis of a really fruitful and close partnership for the future. And I find it striking that if we look underneath the rhetoric of recent years at what the Johnson government has actually done on major foreign policy issues since taking office, again and again, whether it's on climate and carbon, whether it is on Israel-Palestine, whether it is on Iran, whether it is on the Sahel, where the UK has committed further military support to the French-led initiative there, we have seen how the United Kingdom has actually cleaved pretty closely to the mainstream European position despite all the urgings that there have often been from the Trump administration when they were in charge in Washington to do something different. And I think if we look at the Biden administration's approach, they are making it very clear that they see the European allies, the EU members and the non-EU members alike, needing to do more, not just in spending more on defence, but on exercising greater political leadership in defence of democratic and Western interests in a very turbulent, uncertain and increasingly multi multipolar world. So I think our emphasis in our thinking, our work needs to be on how we build that relationship over the years uh, that lie ahead. And one of the things that makes me optimistic is that the demographics are on our side. The 2016 referendum created for the very first time in my life a, a strong, articulate and organised body of pro-European opinion in the United Kingdom. That did not exist in the same way before that referendum. And there are many, many people in the UK who now feel that a part of their identity is European in the broadest sense of that term, who did not feel that particularly strongly before it was put to the test in that vote. And of course, those opinions are, are most to be found amongst young people who voted overwhelmingly to remain. And those are the generations which, as time goes on, will form an ever increasing proportion of the electorate that will determine the future of this country. And these are the people who will rise gradually into positions of leadership in business, in creative life, 
in politics, in public service in this country. So what is it that now should be done? I've said that I want to see a deep and strategic partnership between this country and the EU. It's not something we can build overnight. And after the earthquake of Brexit, we are now still living through a series of aftershocks. And I think those tremors are going to still uh, be recurring for a while yet. And this government, while I think if you read the recent integrated review, it's clear that it wants good relations with our European uh, partners. And I see, I, I, I felt that there were a number of quite important olive branches in that uh, integrated review document. But there is still a neuralgia in Whitehall and Westminster about the idea of institutionalized relations with the EU as a body. And I wish to see everything done uh, on a bilateral basis with key member states. And I think that's to misunderstand the way in which Europe works and thinks these days. And I think for the European movement, uh, who people, people, whichever party they're in, who, who uh, share a belief that the interests of the British people are best served by a close strategic relationship uh, with the peoples and governments of the rest of Europe. It is going to be really important that we show the country as a whole, particularly the more pragmatic people who nonetheless voted to leave the EU, that we see no contradiction between the idea of a European Britain and the idea of a global Britain, but that rather a European Britain, a Britain engaged with and helping to uh, influence and work with the institutions of the EU and the member states of the EU is a stronger, more influential player globally for so doing. And I think issues like uh, climate, particularly with the COP26 conference, coming up in Glasgow later this year, provide us with a real opportunity there. And it will be important to make sure that things like carbon border adjustments and emissions trading systems work between us and the EU in a complementary rather than an adversarial fashion. But if I had to single out sort of key immediate policy targets, I'd just like to suggest three things that we might look at and certainly that interest me. The first is a veterinary treaty. The EU has these with a number, number of countries already. Uh, that a veterinary treaty would streamline the checks on livestock and on food and food products, benefiting businesses, large and small, on both sides of the border with the EU. Secondly, a scientific partnership, including UK participation in EU scientific programmes something that I'm sure would have huge support in the scientific and university communities and where I think it would it would be important to try to resist what I, I hear is treasury pressure uh, for any subscription to EU scientific programmes to have to be paid for from within the current science budget at the cost of other research work. And third, a migration partnership with the EU, focusing upon those areas uh, where there's an obvious mutual interest in ease of movement. Uh, people working in cross-border supply chains, people in financial and professional services, people working in the arts and creative industries where there would be uh, benefits to both sides if such a partnership and a more streamlined system could be agreed between us. <laughs> My starting point and my finishing point is this. The United Kingdom is, as it always has been, a European power, but a European power which also has global interests and a global outlook on its international relationships and its international place. I think that a constructive strategic partnership with the rest of Europe is the best way in which to serve uh, those global interests of the United Kingdom and the security and prosperity of the people of our own country. And despite all the setbacks uh, and all the agonies 
of the last five years. If I look forward, and if I look forward at the the views held in particular by the young men and women of this country, I am optimistic that with determination uh, and with uh, and, and 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 with perseverance, we can establish that new constructive close partnership that I think will serve our interests best. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you, David, so much for that. There's been a huge flurry of questions coming in on the uh, on the chat through the conference system. I think we've got time for probably uh, one or two of them just before we move right. on to our final panel of the day. I, I guess the first thing I'm just going to put on there is uh, Barbara, who uh, echoed your message about cross-party cooperation, and she said that's definitely uh, essential, so please read more of that. And talking about your, uh, and moving on from your comment about uh, building a relationship with Europe, Ian's asking whether you see the single market as a potential keystone to rebuilding an effective political relationship with the EU. Um, I think I'd say thank you to Barbara. To Ian, I'd say, I'd say, um, I, I wish it were that straightforward. I don't think it is that straightforward um, because um, if you are a member, then you set the rules by which that single market operates. And I, I can remember council meetings where the British minister, George Osborne, did this more than once on financial services, would go in. And because a particular change was something that was of the vital interest of the UK, was able to get that. Now, we're not shaping those decisions anymore. And, and I just can't see a Conservative or a Labour prime minister really being happy with the Norwegian position for the long term. I mean, it might have been looking back at a sort of a, a bridge to a different sort of relationship after referendum vote, but for the long term, to simply accept that whatever the 27 decide, we are going to implement automatically. I just don't see that as politically sustainable. So I think rather I'm, what I'm looking at is ways in which possibly sector by sector, you uh, you negotiate um, where there are mutual interests involved. So on good, I mean, my view is that on goods, um, where the key is pretty stable, and where British companies at the moment certainly aren't remotely interested in changing standards. Same is true of, of, of um, agri-food, hence why I think of veterinary standards treaties, both attainable and, and desirable. Um, it seems to me we have everything to gain from going for a close relationship. Services where I think the acquis is much less certain for the future, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure about. I think the balance is a more difficult one to get there. That's great. Thanks for that. And just one final question uh, before we move into our final panel of the day. Uh, Sarah is asking what your opinion is on how the Conservative Party could be moved back to a slightly more central position on Europe. I thought I'd save that one to the end just to get your final comments on nice. that. One. How, long, how long have we got? Um, they, uh, look, it's going to, first thing, it's going to take time. Uh, I think that um, because, you know, we're still in this, this, you know, this, this aftershock and, and the impact of COVID on Parliament and the conduct of politics inevitably make things more more difficult. Um, I think that, um, so I think, first of all, go back to that fifth of people who were, fifth of Conservative voters who were also Remainers. You know, Conservative Party will want to hold on to those people. Without them, there ain't a Conservative majority at Westminster. Conservative Party wants to hold on to young voters, which were, they would be better in, seven, in 90 than 70. We still lag way behind Labour. So, again, that should push the party towards trying to find ways in which to accommodate the objectives of the young people. Conservative Party also wants to hold the Union of the UK together. And that is going to be sensitive and difficult when of the four home nations, two voted, leave, two voted, remain in 2016. But again, that points towards a, an approach to Europe that's a bit you know, more nuanced. And I, my hope is that, you know, as we get move further on and and you know, nobody can say brexit hasn't been done nobody can say the uk is not a sovereign independent country and however full sense of the term you want to define that then it seems to me there might be a greater readiness to say okay we can now negotiate on a sovereign basis with the eu to have a deal on this or that area of politics or economics um and i think that is the way for and i think a lot of this is time and just working together Something like climate, if that works well, if things like the vaccine cooperation that's there in embryo at the moment, like the financial services consultation deal that seems to have been agreed in the last few days, if those start to work and bed down, then 
that starts to provide the the way forward. Final point, and that I will shut up. Then this is, and it's not just for me and conservatives who think like me, but I think this applies across the board to European movement. We have to find ways in which to communicate and interact civilly with people who voted Leave, because there are plenty of people who voted you know, that some who voted Leave. I have you know. Uh, the Farage is this what I have no time for at all. But there were millions of decent, ordinary people who voted for leave because they thought that was the right thing for the country. Some who voted it very much on balance. You know, we, you know they, they weren't quite sure, but OK, we'll give it a go. I believe in this country. And we mustn't hector them and sort of shout that they got things wrong. We have to have conversations with them because actually... They're not people who, for the most part, want bad relations with other European countries. Um, and they will gripe, I think, when travel gets more restricted. And that, that and you see some of the, the practical downsides of Brexit taking effect as, as the COVID um, restrictions come uh, are reduced. So I think so. reaching across the Leave Remain divide is part of what we need to do.